last time we spoke, we saw Prim's algorithm for calculating a minimum spanning tree. Does anyone remember how Prim's algorithm works? How? Oh yeah, pick a note, pick a start. Shh, shh. Hey, everyone be quiet. Shh, shh. I think the next person talking is going to suggest the next step. Pick a start vertex. Oh, yeah, here, no, hang on. Shh, shh, shh. Step number two. You can both do it. Either. No, no, no. Someone else talk. Ah, yeah, you two up there. Step number two. What's step number two of Prim? That's very clever, the way you turn to him like that. I like that. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> do you remember step two of Prim? No. <laughs> okay, well, you guys got to listen because it's rude to talk. Uh, because it's rude. I don't care about being rude to me, but it's rude to the people around you because they can't hear. I know the guys behind you are trying to concentrate on their games, and it's not going to work if you're talking. <laughs> so, sh 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 everyone, everyone, do be quiet. Okay. Step number two a volunteer. Yes. Uh, move. Choose. Yep. A, uh, choose the uh, smallest weighted link from the tree so far to a node not in the tree. Three. Repeat until cook. Okay, that's Prim's algorithm. Shh, shh, shh. Now, here's Richard's law. Prim's algorithm always produces. A minimum spanning spanning tree in any connected graph. It's named after me, actually. Uh, I invented that, Richard's law. Uh, so we've got Prim's algorithm and Richard's law. What's the difference between the algorithm and the law? What's that? The law will either be true or false. Is an algorithm true or false? No, it's just a series of steps. Yes, this has to be proved. This just has to be executed. Now, often people will sneakily, by slipping something in the title of an algorithm, Prim's minimum spanning tree algorithm, it's an algorithm, but when does it become a minimum spanning tree algorithm? when we prove that it's a minimum spanning tree algorithm. Do we believe Richard's law? Who thinks Richard's law is right? Who thinks we need to see a proof of Richard's law? Who doesn't want to see a proof of Richard's law? Okay. <laughs> Who? <laughs> as, as part of our ongoing um, campaign of skepticism, I would really like it if you didn't believe anything that I said ever. And anything particularly containing the words Richard, you should be actually extra skeptical of. You shouldn't believe anything. So there's no point in me giving you an algorithm and then us just moving on. That, would be, what would be the, that wouldn't be algorithms. Yes, that would be just a course in which people told you stuff and you believed it. Yes? Right, what's, the, what's the last word on the third uh, Until cooked. <laughs> Until done. Until lightly browned. <laughs> What should, the, what should the last being be? Repeat until we've reached all nodes. We've included all nodes. We add one new node each time, and we go until we've got to all the nodes. Uh, uh, until we can't find any more links. Yeah. Notice those two things are equivalent, that we haven't proved it, that we'll 
if we haven't done every node, we'll still be able to find a link to it. Why is that? Because it's connected. And um, if we can find a link to a node, then, uh, and we haven't, we can't find a link that, uh, uh, if there's a, an edge that we still have to consider, then there must be a node we still have to consider. I'm just doing the other side of it, because we only consider edges which connect to nodes which haven't yet been reached. So, yeah, so those two things will come up. Okay, so Richard's Law, it's just currently, um, is it right or wrong? Is it okay? It's probably sort of okay. No, it's either right or wrong. So let's prove Richard's Law. Let's prove that Prim's algorithm does always give us a minimum spanning tree in any connected graph. Okay, um, well, let's prove it step by step. First of all, I guess we've got to prove it gives us a tree. And um, then I guess we've got to prove it's a spanning tree. And then I guess we've got to prove it's minimum. How do we know Prim's algorithm will always give us a tree? Yes. You're not allowed to create a loop. In fact, in particular, oh, I wish I hadn't rubbed it out now. As you can see in that part just there, uh, you can only, um, we only consider edges from nodes that we haven't yet reached, from nodes that are currently in the tree to nodes that are currently not in the tree. So the set of nodes that are included in the spanning tree increases by one every time, and we never add an edge between a node that's in the tree and another node that's in the tree. And trees, so if we come into this at any given step with a tree, we'll leave at the end of that step with a tree as well because the edge we've added will A, be joined onto the tree, so it'll be connected, so it'll be still one part of the tree because one edge had to be in the tree, and B, won't be a loop because the other, the other, node, the other um, node on the edge has to be outside the tree so they can't possibly be creating a loop because all the edges that are in the tree are connected to nodes that are in the tree. So to make a loop, it would have to connect to one in the tree. Okay, so we've got it. It's definitely creating a tree. How do we know it's going to be spanning? How do we know that tree is going to include every node on the, the, um, in the graph? Yes, we keep doing the algorithm until we reach every node. That's sort of what we just proved a second ago. We'll keep going and we will eventually reach every node because the algorithm only stops when we've reached every node. Um, so the algorithm isn't going to prematurely stop before we've reached every node. And the only concern we could possibly have is maybe we'll not be able to connect to every node. Maybe there won't be a path to every node, but we've already, we talked about that a second ago. The graph's connected, so there is from any, um, pick any node you want, this, pick any tree and any node that's not in the tree, there's guaranteed to be at least one edge from inside the tree to any given node, uh, for, to, a, to a node that's not in the tree. Um, because the whole graph is connected. So we know we can always increase it by at least size one and, and until we've reached the end. So by the time we've reached the end, we'll have covered all the nodes. So we'll be spanning. Whew. But this is the hard part. How do we know it's minimum? How do we know the edge weights are minimum? Well, I drew a picture before. Let me copy that same picture. Um, suppose our span, uh, the tree we get out of, so we know Prim, Prim's going to give us a spanning tree. So suppose the spanning tree we get from Prim, let's call it P. And it looks something like, uh, I don't know. Actually, let's think about how we built P. P. Notice that the algorithm is adding one new link every time, one edge to it every time. And it's a series of edges then. The recipe for building P is a series of edges that are added one at a time in a particular order. So let's look at that series of edges we add in a particular order. Let's pay close attention to the fact we first did this one, then that one, then this one, then that one, then this one, then that one. Let's just remember the exact order in which we did everything. Okay. Now we've got a spanning tree when we stop, but maybe it's not a minimum spanning tree. Well, if it's not a minimum spanning tree, what does that tell us must exist? Another spanning tree that's smaller. So let's call that other spanning tree what? S. S for smaller, smaller. <laughs> or M for minimum. <laughs> smaller, okay. 
Here's the small, uh, uh, smallest, the smallest spanning tree. Well, there could be several of that size. Yeah. So we've got some smaller spanning tree. Okay. And that's going to look, perhaps it's going to look a bit like P and perhaps it isn't. If it looks exactly like P, what do we know? Uh, yeah, I said suppose it's smaller. Let's not say it's small. It doesn't have to be smaller. Let's suppose it's just the real deal. It's a real spanning tree. It is a genuine article. So we've got a real spanning tree, minimum spanning tree here, and we've got the spanning tree that we've got from Prim. And maybe they're going to be equal, or maybe they're going to be different. And maybe they're going to have some edges in common, and maybe they're not going to have any edges in common. So here's the game we're going to play. Let's grab this tree and stare at it and memorize it and know every single edge on it, and then let's slowly rebuild P. Let's repay the film of us constructing P. And let's add, remember we add edges one at a time as we build P. Let's keep going until we hit the first edge we encounter that's not in R. Now, we obviously can't go to the end, because if we go to the end, they're the same. So if they're the same, we're done. So suppose we don't go to the end. The very first edge we encounter that's not in R. And let's call that, what should we call that? The edge that we've thought of that they didn't think. The edge that they rejected. We'll call that the JW. So we've got JW. In our building history, that's the first edge we added that um, doesn't actually appear in R. Well, JW, when we added it, one end of it was inside our tree, one end of it was outside the tree. And maybe the nodes it was joined to were um, uh, 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 Groucho and Harper. Let's see what would happen if we took that edge and stuck it into R. Well, you guys tell me, what's going to happen if we take that edge and stick it into R? We know it's not already in R by definition. That's how we picked it. So what's going to happen when we insert that edge into R? What are we going to get? A loop. We're guaranteed to get a loop. How many loops are we guaranteed to get? Could we get two loops? No, yes? No, it shouldn't be possible. Does anyone want to challenge that? Does anyone want to see a proof why there's only going to be one loop? Well, not a proof that I planned in advance, but I, it's certainly true. So let's see. Um, we've got some graph. It's a spanning graph, say. If when we add um, JW, We're clearly going to get one loop because by definition there's a path from every node to every node already inside the tree. So when we add another path from Harpa to Groucho, we've now got two paths between them, so that's a loop. Um, how do we know there's not uh, two loops? Because if there were two loops, then that means there would be three paths. Oh, well, um, uh, hmm, maybe the other... Hmm. This edge is in the other loop, isn't it? I think there's only one. Wow. Uh, suppose there was another one. Oh, well, let's draw the other one in. If there's another, if there's an, if there's a, well, yeah, let's let's just highlight the one the one circular path we've found already. The one loop we've created already. There certainly can't be another one. I'm just trying to. Say it nicely. That's the one loop we found already. If there was another loop here, that would mean necessarily that there's got to be another path from here to here. Somehow. And so deleting this would leave one loop. And initially we started with a tree, which has no loops. So I think, I think that does it. So we've now created a loop. Let's look really closely at that loop. That loop contains a series of edges. 
then make a cycle. Remember we're only at this stage, we've been playing this movie of us building P. At this point we haven't completely finished P, we've just added JW. So a whole lot of edges, I'll just dot them to indicate they're, not, they're hypothetical, we haven't yet put them in our tree. A whole lot of edges haven't yet been added. At this point, the only nodes that were in the tree I've coloured in sort of uh, boldy coloured. Just before we added JW. So JW is an edge that goes from something inside of the tree to something outside of the tree. Now, notice that means that in this cycle, there must be one other edge with that property, at least, that goes from inside this tree we've partly constructed here to outside. And the reason for that's sort of obvious. If we've got, these are the nodes that are inside the tree so far, inside P so far, and we've now had one bold guy JW extend outwards, and we know it makes a path that eventually makes a loop. Can you see there's got to be at least one other one somewhere that crosses back in? That's like the loop property. If you pass out, you've got to pass back in. So we know there's another edge in here somewhere which has the property that one of the edges are in P and one of the edges isn't in P. Let's call that, it's going to be like an imposter. What, what's a good name for an imposter? What's that? Spy. Oh, James Bond. Okay, it's the James Bond node. <laughs> so we've got a James Bond node that's in this spanning tree here, in our spanning tree R. And James Bond, and, we, and it, it's clearly not inside this guy so far. Because one edge is inside and one is outside. So let's just think about Mr. James Bond. We know one's in and one's out of P. So at the instant we added JW, we also could have added JB. This was another candidate at that exact instant to be added in. Can you see that's clearly not on the tree already, because if it was, both ends would be in. So it was a candidate, it's connected to the tree though. So we didn't add it. Now you know the you know Prim's algorithm, you know the truth. What's the story? If we didn't add JB at the instant we added JW, what does that tell us about the weight of JB? It has to be greater than or equal to JW. So JB has to be greater than or equal to JW. Hmm. But over here, we chose to add JB instead of JW. What would happen if JW was actually smaller than JB. Suppose that were the case. Suppose our edge, that this guy didn't bother putting in, was actually of lesser weight than this edge, which he did put in. What could we do now? Now we've created this crazy graph here. I'm going to call this crazy graph R crazy. What could we, R crazy has got a loop in it, it's not a spanning tree, but what could we do? We could delete JB. Instantly now it's a tree again. It had one loop, we deleted one thing in the cycle. Now, if you follow it through the reasoning, it'll, you'll see it's still a tree. It's a tree now. Everything's connected to everything. Everything previously was connected to everything. And there were two paths between everything on the cycle. We've broken the cycle, but everything's still connected because we've got the other path. So it's, it's a tree now and it has no cycle. It's still spanning and now it's a tree because it has no loops in it. So now it's a spanning tree. So we've got a spanning tree and all we did was replace one edge with another. So if the weight of this guy that they chose to put in was greater than the weight of the one that we wanted to put in that they didn't bother to pick. Well, this new graph, R crazy, what would it be? It would be a smaller spanning tree. And what do we assume up front? That R was the smallest. So it can't be less than. So what does that tell us about the relationship between JW and JB? They've got to be the same weight. So, there's no supposes about that. So... Here's what I propose we do to R. Let's take R, let's delete JB, and let's insert JW. It's still a spanning tree, it's got exactly the same weight as before, but now it's got one more edge in common with this. Does everyone see? Exactly the same weight as before, still a spanning tree, 
but now it's, it's still the minimum spanning tree because it's got the same weight as the original one that was really the minimum, R, really the minimum spanning tree, but now it's got one more edge in common. Now what am I going to say after we've done that? I'm just going to say repeat. <laughs> so before, we went through and we found the very first one that was in this guy, not in the R ideal one. And now we've created a new ideal one that has that edge in it. So now if we play our movie, we'll go at least one step further before we find an edge that's not in it. And if we keep iterating that over and over again, we'll find gradually that each edge that's in this can be inserted into that and we'll still have a spanning tree. And by the end, we'll make them exactly identical and we'll be able to get all the way to the end and not find a single edge that's in them. And they're the same. Hence, Prim gave us a minimum spanning tree. It was the minimum. Whew. Now that's a proof. You don't always have to do a proof, but someone has to do the proof. And you have to read it and look at it and agree with it, or look at someone really clever that you really respect that reads it and, looks, and gets secondhand proof, or something like that. Primary evidence is best, secondary is better, uh, I mean, not quite as good, tertiary is not so good. Okay, so this is our skepticism. In an algorithms course, there's no way we should just look at algorithms. We really need to, at all points, prove the algorithms correct. Now, up until now, it's been fairly trivial to prove they're correct with sorting algorithms or searching algorithms, but. Uh, with the tree algorithms, now our intuition might not be exactly perfect. All right, so you've seen how to construct a minimum spanning tree. But that's not going to help you with your assignment. Well, it might. Anyone using spanning trees in their assignment? It could. I think what you're going to need to know for your assignment is, how can I quickly get from here to here? What's the shortest path from here to here? Now, your graph has no weights. The edges have no weights. They're just edges. It takes one turn to move along an edge. Well, that's just a different graph. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the railway's just a different graph. What it really means is that the graph you're on changes <laughs> all the time. So if we um, just restrict ourselves to the road and not worry about this annoyance of the changing graph, you are going to ask, want to ask questions like, what's the best path I can take to get there? What's the best journey? This is a really common question in graphs, finding the shortest path. For example, um, um, an assignment I keep nearly setting, but not, and you might inherit it next year, is uh, to write a, an, a little web robot that goes to the internet movie database and harvests the text information about each movie but not downloading any images or um, bandwidth expensive things, and slowly building up a database of all movies, and then what do we want to calculate? Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon. We're going to calculate Kevin Bacon. You know the game Kevin Bacon? Has anyone ever played that game? You have to find a link between Kevin Bacon and any, anyone else in the world. So you say, oh, well, I don't know, uh, Sissy Spacek. What's the link from Kevin Bacon to Sissy Spacek? Well, Sissy Spacek was once in a movie with, uh, I'm making all this up now, I can't remember any movies she's been in, isn't that terrible? Uh, with, um, with Lassie, the Wonder Dog. And Lassie, and in and that movie, which was called, um, what's that, Lassie? They're stuck in the, lum, in the mine. The person that did the audio was Fred Glitz. And Fred Glitz also did the audio in Star Wars. And uh, are we close? Can anyone think of a link from Star Wars to Kevin Bacon? Kevin Bacon saw Star Wars. No, no, he's, 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 <laughs> Kevin Bacon saw Star Wars. <laughs> There's a link from us to Kevin Bacon. Uh, Kevin Bacon's actually married to the person that wrote your textbook, of all bizarre things. So in a sense, you've got a Kevin Bacon link of two. But we're only, we're only um, going to... Uh, consider links that are in IMDb, so in the cast and crew list. So uh, maybe Star Wars had in it uh, Harrison Ford, and Harrison Ford was also in... Uh, what's a movie Kevin Bacon's been in? He's not been in any movies, has he? Makes it really hard. Everyone's got an infinite Kevin Bacon number. Uh, he was... Kevin. Oh, Harrison Ford did the carpentry in um, that movie about hollow things. What's that? Hollow Men. Kevin Bacon, uh, uh, before he was famous, Harrison Ford was a carpenter and he did all the carpentry in Hollow Men and um, Kevin Bacon was in Hollow Men. So we go one, uh, one, uh, zero, one, two, three, four. So Sissy Spacek so far has a Kevin Bacon number of four. 
Except some of you might be really clever and you might discover something else crazy like Sissy Spacek did uh, when she was a tiny girl did something in uh, Unforgiven and Unforgiven uh, one of the extras doing cameo role as never reported was um, uh, 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 someone like Quentin Tarantino and Quentin Tarantino and Kevin Bacon Quentin Tarantino starred in Kevin Bacon's first film that he ever directed. Okay, and so you might find there's an actual link of zero, one, two, three. But is that the best? Well, you have to keep looking. You never know if you found the best. You'll find the best so far, but you might have to keep looking. So this problem of finding the um, Kevin Bacon number is the shortest path graph problem. Or in chess, suppose I've got a sequence of chess moves. I know from any given state in chess how to transform it to another state with just one move. Can you see that gives rise to a huge graph? where the nodes on the graph are states in a chess game and the arcs on the graph are single legal moves in a chess game. And then I could ask you a puzzle, what's the smallest number of moves to get from here to here? And that would be, um, uh, that would be a shortest path problem. Not that actually that's such an interesting problem to answer because your opponent might not do the right moves, but if you were both cooperating or something like that. Actually, that's a terrible example now, think about it. Okay, a better example is, um, uh, Oh, oh, I know, mathematicians, uh, the Kurds uh, back in the first century, about the year 1000, not first century, first millennium, about the year 1000 were you know, a massive, amazing force in astronomy and physics and, and mathematics, and for many hundred years they remained so. And to, the, to the extent that these days mathematicians are still really impressed by uh, um, Kurds, and basically any uh, Kurdish mathematician is regarded with a bit of respect in the mathematical community. And we say uh, mathematicians have gone... Uh, have built up this thing called the Kurdish number. I don't know if anyone's heard of that, where if you're a Kurdish mathematician, your Kurdish number is zero. And if you've ever published a paper with a Kurdish mathematician, your Kurdish number is one. And if you've ever published a paper with someone whose Kurdish number is one, your Kurdish number is two. And most mathematicians in the world have a Kurdish number around about eight or less. So again, finding your Kurdish number is the shortest path problem. Does that make sense? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so graphs pop up all the time, and finding shortest paths on them is a really common thing to do. So let's have an algorithm to find the shortest path on a graph. Oh, a last one, the internet. You send your packet out. The internet's a huge graph. Somehow your packet has to be sent by a sensible route to get to the destination, and we'd like it to take the shortest route we can. Route we can. Now over the whole internet, that's hard to optimize, but over really large internal subnets, if we know the topology of the network entirely, we can actually calculate the minimum path. And in fact, that's what um, one of the most common internet routing protocols uses. Uh, it uses a brilliant al algorithm invented by Dijkstra. Well, so I'm not 100% sure it was invented by Dijkstra, but certainly named after Dijkstra. All these algorithms were simultaneously invented by hundreds of people. Uh, but uh, Dijkstra, does anyone know, was Dijkstra's algorithm actually first invented by Dijkstra? Or did someone else invent it first? Some Kurdish mathematician, perhaps. <laughs> no one knows? Let's say. Dijkstra, in one of his breaks from his band in his early years, they used to have to work out how to get the gear from one uh, uh, st stadium to the next, and he'd have the road network in front of him and all the different amount of time it would take to travel over every leg of the road. And uh, early calculations he used to do with the logistics for the man was working out the fastest way of getting from one stadium to the next. And he used an algorithm that later on everyone called Dijkstra's algorithm in honor of his mum, which was uh, given a graph, let's find some shortest paths in it. Now there's a, 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 a whole heap of shortest path algorithms you could come up with. You could come up, find the shortest path between two points. That's called the single pair, shortest path. Or you might, if you say we've just performed in this town and now we don't know which town we're going to next, what's the shortest journey to all of the other towns so we can make an informed decision? That's single source, shortest path. So find the shortest path to everywhere on the graph, not just to one other point. You could obviously get a single um, source shortest path by iterating single pair shortest path over all, um, all the pairs that start here, but there's actual, you get partial information along the way, so there's actual more optimized algorithms you can do if you know you want single source. Similarly, there's single destination. And maybe you want to know all, for all, everyone on the graph, 
from every possible spot to every other possible spot. From all pairs, what's the shortest path between them? That's called all pairs. Shortest path. OK, well, let's look at Dijkstra, which works out well, which we can use to work out a couple of those. But basically, we'll, we'll start off by just working out single pair shortest path. We've got, we're going to use Dijkstra's algorithm. Well, actually, we don't need Dijkstra's algorithm for the assignment. Maybe, um, what's another algorithm we could use if you wanted to find the shortest path between two points in the assignment? And the reason I say we don't need Dijkstra's is Dijkstra's very good at finding the shortest where edges have weights. But if all your edges have weight one, if they're all equal citizens, then you can use a simplified algorithm. We don't need to go to the trouble of Dijkstra. Yeah. Breadth first search. Yeah, how does that work on a graph? Do you remember how breadth first search works? Take a note and cue all its children. Okay, okay. So we'll take the start node. We'll take sh 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 one. Uh, uh, what do we call uh, putting someone onto the queue? You called it NQ. That's, that sounds weird, though. NQ and DQ? That sounds. That sounds like rap, a rap artist. <laughs> Shouldn't we say, like, ins we can't say insert, join the queue? Come on, everyone, join the queue, man. It's more catchy than NQ. All right, NQ. All right. So we're going to NQ, NQ the start. So we're going to put the start into our empty queue. And then two, and we're going to do while queue not empty, we're going to do, OK, we're going to uh, take someone off the queue, which you call DQ, DQ the head. Is the head? Equal to our destination. Woohoo! If it is, stop. Yay! We've made it. Has the head already been visited? Oh, well, well, that straight away suggests that we need to have on the side here. All our vertexes will have an array to say whether they've been visited or not. And initially, they'll all be false. And whichever one, uh, has it been visited? No, it hasn't been visited. Uh, if yes, uh, has it has it already been visited? Has it uh, do nothing? Else, what do we do? So we've reached a node we haven't currently we've never reached before. It's not where we want to go. So what do we do? We NQ its children. NQ. It's children. And that's it. Uh, three. Yay. Meatballs. So, shh, shh, shh. does that make sense? Run over this. Whenever we reach a node. Oh, 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 oh. NQ is children. And what else do we better do? Market visited. So we don't visit it again. So this will visit each node exactly once. And when it visits a node, it'll link you all its children on. And at the end, when we get to the destination, we'll stop and we'll go, yeah, it's not structured because I've got an exit in the middle. But that's the algorithm. Does that make sense? That's a breadth first search. It applies to any structure, not just a graph, to anything you want a breadth first search. Trees, anything that's got some sort of connection information. Actually, I guess that's a graph, isn't it? <laughs> In some form or other, it's something that's equivalent to a graph. OK, um, so that's breadth first search. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool. Only problem is, when this stops, we'll be at the destination, but we, maybe we didn't want to find the destination. For task two, you did. 
For task two, you're doing a search through the space of all possible programs, and you were hunting for a particular program. And when you got it, you printed it out, you got to the A step, you printed it out, and you were done. But in this one here, in Dracula, when I'm saying, I, I want to know the shortest path between you and you, I don't want just to print out, yeah, I got to the end. What else do I need to know? What's the path? <laughs> I need to record the path. So uh, we're going to have to modify this to record the path. And th it's very simple to do that. How would we do that? Yeah. Yeah, add it to the queue. Add its children. Its children, we won't say the children are nodes. We'll say the children, the children edges. So we'll add the edges to the queue. And... And we'll keep a parent list, which is initially just empty. And in fact, this is going to exactly correspond to visited, so maybe this will allow us to not have visited. And whenever we visit a node for the first time, we'll look at which edge got us here, which was we just popped off in the head. We'll look at the edge in the head. The edge has two nodes on it, us, where we are now, and where we came from. Record where we came from. The first time you visited, record where you came from, that's your dad. Dad's node 7. No, the dad for node 3 is node 7, and so on. Record that in this thing here. Then when you get to the end, when you get to the end, you know the dad of the destination. That's the one you're at one step before the destination. So go to that node, you know the dad of that, look it up on the chart. That's where you came from before that. Keep following that way until you get back to the beginning. Then you've got the whole path. Does that make sense? Okay, so we just have to annotate a little bit of extra information, augment our data structure slightly. You can see probably how you can merge these two into one, and lo and behold, we can extract the entire path. Okay, all right, well done. Uh, does that work? How do we know that works? Probably works, doesn't it? Did I write? Ah. Shortest path algorithm. Now we know it works. Okay. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Correct. <laughs> <laughs>